Good morning, ladies and gentlemen from the Horsehead Central School District. Today is the question and answer session for our parents. We have two sessions today, one at nine o'clock and one at five o'clock. These are being live streamed. Although we are Zoomed, this is also being sent out through another purveyor. So there may be some technical glitches that we uh, encounter, but we wanted to give you some information about that. So in order to talk about ways to alleviate that as well, I will turn you over to our Director of Technology, who is also live streaming and recording this program for later viewing as well. At this time, Mr. Gene Coley, could you help our guests in this broadcast format? Yes, yeah, so we are live streaming. We are actually have a bunch of participants in the Zoom meeting and then we're putting out towards GST BOCES who's helping us out with three servers that are pushing this out to the community. So you can find this link usually on our website. Uh, we also sent out an email blast on Friday and I believe later last night that you can look at your email, click on that link and it should open up. If you're having difficulty with buffering, you can always refresh your web page. That's always a good way to kind of get the buffering to um, start up and run a lot uh, quicker. Also, if you're in your house and you're viewing this on a broadband, but you're view there's a couple other things streaming, like you have music streaming or Netflix or something else, um, you may want to look at those, and maybe stop that just to kind of control the bandwidth that is happening in your home. Um, so those are the things you can kind of do. Um, if you're looking on a cell phone, a hardwired or a <laughs> Wi-Fi connection tends to be better. So I would suggest uh, looking at those if you're running into any issues. But as Dr. Douglas has stated, we are recording this. So we will have this uh, posted later on. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today as we get ready to start the 2020-2021 school year. We have several individuals on this Zoom uh, presentation with us. We have our high school principal, Ms. Chris Earl. We have our middle school principal, Mr. Ron Holloway. We have our director of transportation, Mr. Pete Wilcox. We have our director of facilities, Mr. Michael Coglin. We have our director of food service, Mr. Joe Kilmer. My assistant superintendent, Anthony Gill. Our director of student services, Ms. Kelly Squires. And our assistant superintendent of business, Katie Bazzetti, and of course, uh, our Director of Technology, Mr. Bill Giancoli, and myself. Uh, there's been many questions, and since uh, we were waiting from June 1st to get started on this and not being allowed to by the Department of Health and our state uh, government uh, until roughly around July 15th, uh, we have put together a collaboration of plans with parent stakeholders and teacher and staff stakeholders and community stakeholders. We were one of the only districts to pull people together over a two week period to try to address the requirements by the Department of Health and the State Education Department to ensure as safe as possible an opening of school in one of the three continuum formats that have been allowed by the governor. At this time to answer one of the questions, why aren't we here at five days a week? That's what 53% of the parents wanted on the survey. That is not a survey for a decision making tool because we did not survey every single family, but we do recognize it. The real problem is not that we had 53% of those that responded saying one to one five days a week. The issue is that the district of this size, unlike smaller districts, is unable to meet the vast requirements for social distancing capacity required by the State Department of Health, which oversees and guides our uh, opening. So please understand that we would all love to be one-to-one -one every single day of the week in the safest format possible, but with the current state of environment and the guidelines that we must have, we cannot achieve that. So we are in the hybrid and remote format at this point, unless ordered by the governor to change. So I hope that helps to explain that. Um, and we hope that as we move forward, we will get through this as quickly as possible. Today's meeting is going to focus on really three major issues, health and safety, instructional um, programming, and then financials. Uh, we will have uh, various questions. We have the questions. We wanna thank everybody for putting them in. We will try to cover them throughout this process as I try to check off. Some of the format is I will interrupt to ask a couple additional questions that maybe I did not see. 
uh, or have answered yet or do a double check at the end. We expect to be about an hour, hour and a half uh, as there is about 50 detailed questions, some with multiples that were submitted and we thank everybody for their participation. So as we get started at this point, we want to talk about health and safety in our facilities throughout our district and what we do to keep them safe. I will turn it over to Ms. Caitlin DeFilippo and Mr. Michael Coglin, as they are head of our safety committee and have vast amount of work in each of these areas. So Caitlin or Mike, whichever one wants to start first. <clears throat> I'd be happy to start, Tom. Um, we do have a PowerPoint presentation that uh, might be helpful to walk through if we wanna talk about implementation of the plan before we uh, go through this. And I can hop in when we get to the health and safety slides. Caitlin, would you like me to present that PowerPoint now? Yes. So as a, as a lead in, some of the questions we had been receiving had to do with the, um, as, as Dr. Douglas was talking about, the plan and the decisions to, to why we led to this, this hybrid model. And um, as a, a, a to, to just understand the process and understand how we went about this work. So um, keep in mind, uh, and Bill, go ahead and you can move forward to this. Um, we had to keep these things at the forefront of our brain and conversations had with many of the teams talked about those priorities and our vision statement in mind. How do we keep towards uh, attaining that vision and our work as we do with students and with our staff. Uh, that safe physical environment for all our students and staff addressing the social emotional well being of our students and our staff and developmentally appropriate and differentiated instructional approach. So those were at the forefront of our, our committees and our brain uh, as we as we did this work. So I just want to briefly just talk about what that looks like uh, and that process of the plan creation. Um, we had um, so go ahead, Bill, go ahead. The next piece of that. So between these dates, you know, we were uh, announced from the state ed department uh, as well as the Department of Health of the rules that we had to follow. Um, in a very short turnaround process, as Tom was saying, we had a number of teachers, parents, staff, administrators, community members come together, 80 stakeholder groups and five different group uh, committees to really look at that preliminary survey, again, as not a, a guide our thinking and our, and our work, as Tom was saying, and analyze the, the health and the uh, the health and the education department documents and look to what's the best plan for horse sets. And those five key areas, um, again, being health, safety, transportation, nutrition, social, emotional, well-being, and instruction. Um, so we studied research, discussed um, the, the feasibility of uh, the three plans that we required to uh, submit to New York State. Um, in the creation of those three models, again, 100% remote or online, a hybrid model of some sort, and then 100% in-person as we're required to submit and, and talk to New York State about. Um, many of the committees talked about what it looks like and the possibility of bringing all students back to school every day. Uh, that was, as Tom said, something that we had seen in that initial survey. Um, however, given the requirements of the Department of Health, um, the, the social distancing requirements, the, the, our facilities, our staffing, uh, transportation um, requirements, and what the Department of Transportation was saying, and uh, the cafeteria, the health and safety, um, it was uh, not advisable that we would bring back students, all students, every day for five days uh, in a row. Uh, obviously, that is the goal. We would all love to have some normalcy and have our students back in our, in our, in our building, um, but to meet the mandates and the requirements and the musts of these uh, uh, Department of Health um, it's not feasible um, for us to, as a district to move forward in that model. So with that, we jump to our next phase, which was implementation. And it's important as we go through this conversation to see that we are not, um, we're in the middle of implementation. You can see those dates. We are still developing and moving and working on processes to, to make September 8th and the beginning of the school year happen. Um, we, we have a lot of information that's come in with the completion of those, the parent selection of the model and the, the assignments of those cohorts. Uh, those notifications will be going out today um, after we merge them in and send them out to parents. Um, that, uh, uh, one important thing to remember there is we, we honored households and tried to uh, accomplish that task of having students um, in the same household on the same cohort day. 
Um, so as you receive those parents and, and you see there's a, there might be an issue with um, a, a child uh, in your household not in the same cohort as others, please reach out to the building principal for that conversation uh, and, what the, um, and, and working through that, that, um, that error, to be honest with you, and, and make it right. So um, again, there's this um, questions that came from this document about the students moving from hybrid to 100% remote and vice versa. We know that we had to think about capacity from our health and safety team, that in the implementation and the creation of these cohorts, we can only have so many students safely in the room, socially distanced, so that the, as we're gonna talk about masks in a moment, um, could be removed um, during instruction. So we definitely had um, student um, um, creation of these cohorts so that at any moment, yes, we can go to 100% remote. That is, that is built into the system. Um, it's a different story when a child is going to look to go from the 100% remote into the hybrid because there's a capacity of the classroom that's already been preset by the selection of parents. And we do have to, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very difficult and it, it, we have to, like I said, maintain the, the, the capacity of the classrooms and the cohorts that have already been assigned through the parents that have selected that hybrid model. So if, there's, if that comes to light, obviously conversations with the building principal and we'll, we'll see what can happen on that. But obviously um, for right now, those, those will be set in that hybrid model and then when that 100% remote. Um, so you'll get the assigned model, those notifications will be going out. Pete and his team will be doing that bus routing and determining how we're going to pick up the students that have requested the transportation. And you will hear there's questions about that, that for, from the community that uh, Pete will, will speak to momentarily. Um, and obviously preparing our facilities, finalizing those master schedules, the, the cafeteria usage you'll hear momentarily as well, and what are those instructional expectations? And um, I think maybe at this point, maybe either Caitlin or Tom, you can talk, there's questions about that 5% and 9% and the 14 seven day rule by the governor. Yeah, Tony, you're right. So right now uh, we are, we know we are able to have any students back in the building because uh, looking at our regional infection rate, uh, fortunate we are we are low. We are under one percent. Uh, the governor has said we are able to reopen if the infection rate rate is less than five percent over a fourteen day rolling average. Uh, we know as a rule that schools will close if that regional infection rate rises above nine percent. So if we do get above nine percent at this moment under the current standard, uh, we would transition back to a fully remote operation. I can talk through some of the other health and safety aspects. So Horseheads is confident that we have a plan in place that will, we will be able to meet all the Department of Health requirements as far as health and safety for students. It does rely on a, a great bit of participation from the parents. We really need parents and families to be partners in this with us. It starts all the way from before you send your kids to school in the morning. Um, there will be temperature screenings each day at the door. I think in any student who um, has a temperature of over 100 will be sent to the nurse's office and they, they will have to make a call home and the ch child will need to be picked up from parents. It's probably a very good idea if parents get in the habit of uh, checking, their own, checking their children for symptoms each morning, uh, checking their temperature before they send them to school, so there aren't any surprises once they do come to school. It we might be important to also note there, Caitlin, um, is that with that temperature check of 100 or more at school, it is not that uh, we want the kids to go home later in the day, but it is an immediate call to parents an immediate pickup. This is a health and safety issue, and that's where we need the parents the most. One way or another, if you check at home, if you're in doubt, move them to 100% online for that day to make sure, and that should be lower than 100% with no fever reducing medicine to return to school for 72 hours after the fever breaks. That is very important to help us all stay safe. We will also have weekly screenings. You might have become accustomed to these screenings if you've been to the doctor's office or even to get your 
haircut, it's salons. Um, it's basically a screening that asks four simple questions to uh, figure out whether someone has been in close or proximate contact with someone who has had COVID-19 or if there has been travel to uh, a state that's been designated on the New York State travel advisory list um, in the past 14 days before quarantine. Uh, so that's our, that's our first line as far as how we get students into the school and the uh, um, screenings that will be happening. Um, secondly, there, we had a lot of questions come in about masks. What do masks look like? And mask use is crucial. That is uh, an important part of our plan. Uh, Horsehead Schools does require facial coverings in all district buildings and facilities by everybody. So students, staff, and visitors, they will need to be worn on anytime they're on district transportation, anytime anyone's in the hallway, if you're uh, moving between hallways and, or the lunchroom, during bathroom trips, at any school functions. Um, in the classroom too, we know that uh, we will be working in mask breaks um, during the classroom. If you are in the classroom and your, your students are completely stationary and the, the teacher is able to be in a, a safe spot uh, and also socially distanced, everyone's socially distanced and stationary, then students would be permitted to take their masks off. Um, if then the instruction changes and there's some activity in the classroom where the teacher has to approach your student or maybe students have to get closer to each other than is socially distanced, then the teacher will give a, a cue to the kids, okay guys, it's, it's mask time and everyone will be putting their masks on at that point. And we do expect that um, students need to follow reasonable directions of their teachers. Another important part, if your, your kids want to wear their masks 100% of the day, that's A-OK. -okay. Um, and in fact, we, we would encourage that. That's, that's uh, um, absolutely fine. And we do highly encourage mask use as much as possible. As far as what, contemplate, what constitutes a mask, it needs to be something that covers both the nose and the mouth. It can be cloth or it can be the disposable kind. Um, face shields, so face shields don't meet that threshold, uh, but you can send a, a, face shield, a face shield with your student if, the, if they would like to wear the face shield. In addition to the mask, that's fine. If they'd like to slip it on anytime they are socially distant and work that into their mask breaks, that's fine too. Students can take off their masks, obviously, at lunchtime once they get to their seat and they're, they're ready to eat their lunch. If there's any problem with the mask, if your mask uh, gets lost during the day or gets dirty or maybe the uh, strap breaks on it, we will have replacement masks available for all students. If a student, if your student doesn't have masks, you're not able to provide a mask, we will have them available for all students, both in the buildings and on the buses too. So they'll, the, all bus drivers will have a supply ready to go if somebody comes and forgot, forgets their mask. And we want to also thank everybody because within the survey that we put out, almost 98% of the individuals said that they would provide the PPE, um, such as masks and so forth for their student. This would be a significant cost. We still have to prepare for it, but your assistance as well as I'm hoping our staff's assistance will minimize our costs so that we can focus that those additional costs that we have on other areas of safety and operation. So thank you. And if you have any questions, please contact your building principals. If there's a student who perhaps can't wear a mask for health reasons, it's important that you work with your physician as soon as possible because there, there will be a process for us to uh, review any accommodations that may be needed by your students. So review that with your, your physician as soon as possible so you can get that to us. So then we can work through our process of uh, working with our school physician and making sure that we're accommodating what kids need, but we're also making sure that we are keeping everyone as safe as possible. Um, I know I've talked a few times about parent cooperation. This is something we need with masks. This is something we need with social distancing. 
Um, if you've taken a look at our frequently asked questions, you probably noticed on there that there, there, there has been a superintendent's directive that Dr. Douglas has issued. And it says that failure to follow any of our plan elements or our protocols will result in a code of conduct violation for the students. So this and failure to comply with wearing a mask, social distancing, anything that comes up like that will be strictly enforced. These will be seen as disciplinary issues and uh, administrative staff will absolutely be following up on those. It would be important to note parents that we don't wish to take a heavy hand, but when it comes to the issues of safety and security of staff, students in the community and our schools, we will be taking a much firmer position. Please understand that because in secondary schools, we deal with any type of vapor, vaping and so forth, which is aerosolization of any compound, that is an extreme safety violation and will be dealt with disciplinarily with the unfortunately most severe restrictions. Please make sure you have communications with your students. If you know or have understood that they vape or any way with uh, smoking and so forth, those cannot be tolerated at this time. I hope you can understand. Um, but I think before Mike Cogman, the director of facilities, is going to talk in detail about what the cleaning protocols and what all the facilities team steps they are taking to look into ventilation and uh, how that is going to look and the steps we're taking. I think it's probably a good point for me to just mention uh, we received a lot of questions about what happens if uh, someone, a, teach, a student or a teacher in the school tests positive for coronavirus. Will the schools be testing for coronavirus? Uh, will the teachers be required to get tests every couple of weeks? Unfortunately, no, we do not have the capacity to have a, a independent testing laboratory set up in the district. Um, we are looking to the Chemung County Department of Health for help on how we approach these kind of issues with testing. And we do know that we will be, um, what, what signs to look for. And anytime a student or staff member is sent home following a, a, a presentation of COVID-19 symptoms, or perhaps they come ill during the day, that will be communicated to the Shimon County Department of Health. And then so after after someone does go home, there were a lot of questions received about what do we do, what do we do to get this person, whether it is a staff member or a student, back into the school and make sure that they don't present a threat to everyone else in school, that we're doing what we need to keep everybody safe. Um, there is a protocol, so to return to school, we do need at minimum documentation from a healthcare provider uh, that the person is clear to return to school and also a negative COVID test, and symptoms also have to be resolved. Now, if there was a, a student or a staff member who has a, who, who tests positive for COVID-19, they would not be permitted to return to school until the Shimon County Department of Health has released them at, from isolation. And we will, we will be making sure that we do have that documentation in place. And we have the, the green light that the, um, the individuals are they're healthy and they're ready to come back to school. We will also be working with Shimon County Department of Health as far as contract tracing. Uh, we, despite the fact that students have been dismissed for a while now, uh, a lot of our other staff has been working 12 months and we have developed a good line of communication with the Department of Health uh, to approach how we deal with contract tracing. Um, and we know that we will be working with them to help make sure that we are um, approaching that issue well and that we, we are vetted it. There's no one clear line of um, an automatic rule of what happens. It really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Chemung County Department of Health tells us that the closure could range um, 
depending on what the impact is. It could be certain groups who are quarantined. It could be specific buildings. It could be the entire school district. It really depends on what the issue is presented and uh, what the best science is and the, what the public health experts tell us is the best thing to do at that moment. And, and we will be following that. This might be a good segue into uh, what Mr. Coughlin and his team at facilities are doing to make sure that the school setting is as safe as possible. Good morning. <clears throat> Mike Coughlin, Director of Facilities for the Horseheads District. I'd like to talk a little bit about the cleaning procedures and schedules and how we're preparing the buildings for the students and staff uh, to come back. Uh, first of all, we, you know, we're governed. We will be following the CDC, Department of Health, and the New York State Education Department's guidelines for opening a school. Uh, we've been monitoring uh, these guidelines that they've been coming out, and since we've been going through um, this epidemic with the COVID-19 uh, for many months. Uh, our cleaning procedures, just to assure, we will be uh, daily disinfecting all classrooms, bathrooms, hard surfaces, um, cafeteria area, the playgrounds. We will be out daily to disinfect the playgrounds in the morning uh, before the kids are using them. Then throughout the day, we'll be following, depending on the use of following the guidelines uh, to continue disinfecting, cleaning, keeping the area safe for all the uh, students and staff that will be in attendance on any given day. Um, We've looked at new technology. We'll be talking a little bit of you've seen between misting and fogging, uh, ceramic coating. We are, there's an assurance policy on all hard surfaces, cafeteria tables, desks, teachers, adding a protective layer of ceramic coating uh, that's come out with technology that's gonna help us uh, keep everybody safe. Hand washing stations, we've been looking throughout the district. Water fountains will be Bottle fillers only operational as they're going through. Um, the fogging and disinfecting that will be going on, this will not, I'd like to ensure, be done while the students are in attendance or staff around. We'll be following the guidelines, keeping everyone safe. Um, we hired a consultant for the district to help us get through these new chemicals to make sure cross contamination. Um, and any concerns we have, as well as training our staff on the new technology to come in to make sure we're doing it appropriately to maximize the disinfection uh, and the cleaning that will be going on. We have looked at district-wide air filtration. This was an area that, that we know this is very important. We currently have ordered all ventilation throughout the district. We'll be going to at least a MERV 13 filter. And this was a recommendation from the state. Um, Along with that, we will be making mechanical changes to our devices, maximizing the amount of outside air we can bring in a room, which will vary. In so many cases, we'll be bringing 100% outside air until the temperature changes. This will ensure us that we're making up that fresh air um, in all the spaces that uh, are run mechanically, uh, far exceeding what the recommendations are from the state at this time, uh, as well as, again, the district has secured a consultant uh, let alone if it be our engineers on half or third parties to evaluate the changes being made to make sure that we can ensure the safety of all of our students and staff. Um, classroom setups, I'm certain people have been hearing on that. We have uh, been removing stuff for the last couple of weeks and getting the classroom set up in a social distancing educational setting. So all students, as you've heard, uh, Mrs. DeFilippo talking when they're coming into the rooms and we look for mass breaks. This will allow when the classroom is set up and there are under, uh, in their teaching station, the teachers at their spot, that this would allow a student to take a mask off if they wish to at this particular time, along with the other mass breaks. So all rooms for educational settings are being set up uh, with social distancing in mind. Um, Mike, if I can just interject, uh, it's important parents understand that those mask breaks, face shields, and the mask use 
is still subject in the classroom to the discretion of the teacher when students are unable to be social distancing or there is movement. It is important to explain this to the students as well for everyone's safety. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Uh, again, on you know, removing from the rooms, a lot of the extra pieces of furniture to maximize this distance has been going on, like I said, for the last couple of weeks. You'll notice as you enter our building, signage throughout the buildings will help us maintain a flow to keep uh, students in a direction as well as visitors coming into the building to maximize social distancing. Again, all signage will be done throughout the district. Um, and for the, and recess, again, as we talked just briefly, I apologize, I'm looking at this. Uh, uh, all the areas that'll be used, we put the ceramic coating will be going on the playgrounds as well as it'll be disinfected daily and we will monitor, follow guidelines on any of the areas that the kids will be using. Cafeterias. Cafeterias are being set up again to allow the kids to get a break to, for the most part, to be into the cafeteria. They'll be set up again at a six foot social distancing. Uh, these areas will be disinfected daily. Uh, again, coming back through disinfecting and sanitizing throughout the day, depending on the use of these areas. Um, so I can assure you that we've looked at all areas, all areas coming into the district and the district is still working on plans at this time as it's changing and we're seeing the numbers, uh, but we will be ready for when the students and the staff come back to follow all guidelines that we've been instructed to follow. Mike, could you talk about just temperature on the second floor, heat, whether it's at the high school, middle school, and so forth. Uh, ultimately, once we get through with the whole construction and re, um, refurbishment of the entire district, our intent is to have air, but we're just not there yet. Yes, Dr. Douglas, uh, through some of the surveys, some of the concerns, and this has been ongoing prior to the situation we're in now, but with that increased ventilation, uh, it'll be brought on earlier each day uh, to bring in some fresh cooler air. Windows we are monitoring to be opening. We are looking at additional fans in the buildings. Uh, this ventilation historically is run when we're occupied in the buildings we're required. This will run after hours a little bit longer, so we will be monitoring um, temperatures in the rooms. Uh, additional staff, the district is uh, looking at currently to secure additional staff to help with these needs and some of the duties on these needs of this additional staff. We're getting the book buildings opened up a little bit earlier in the morning and increase airflow in the morning. We're hoping this will help with the comfort um, as well as the fresh air in all these spaces. Thanks, Mike. I thought um, I'd mentioned before we move on to transportation, I thought I'd mention one more health and safety issue. Um, as we know, the summer is drawing to a close here and a lot of families are thinking about enjoying their, their last bit of um, summer fun here. I just want to remind all the parents watching that there is a New York State travel advisory in effect. So make sure that you are um, looking at that list of high spread states uh, because uh, unfortunately, um, if, if it's a family does travel to one of these states, the students would not be permitted to come into our schools unless they have completed the mandatory 14 day isolation. So I know we're getting close on timeline there. I just wanted to put that reminder out. Yeah, it's also important okay. to remind everybody because schools are mandated reporters uh, in regards to this as partnership with the county health departments. Please understand that we regularly get individuals within the community that will send us an email or uh, information in regards to someone else's travel requirements, as you can imagine please understand the school must turn all that information over to the Department of Health. And if someone is found within violation, it could come with a hefty fine. So we are trying to give you the warnings beforehand. Please uh, be very mindful of that so that you're not caught in any situation. I know many people are not traveling, but if you do, please make sure you adhere to that quarantine rule.
Okay, I guess that's me, transportation. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Pete Wilcox, the Director of Transportation here. And uh, I have to say, just to start off, that I was really proud of the way that the school district did this because the way the committees were set up and represented uh, gave us an opportunity to look at so many different points of view from what we were doing. That being said, we also had the guidelines that SED gave us and they were pretty specific in what, what they were telling us uh, to do or not do. Um, and there's just two parts, uh, two points that I wanna share with you uh, on that. The first one is just a reminder to us, this is right in the guidelines, that the school bus is a, an extension of the classroom. Therefore, many of the recommendations that apply to school buildings, like social distancing and frequent cleaning should be applied to the school bus as well. Uh, so we took that very seriously. And every part of what we discussed in the committee uh, has to do with making sure that everybody stays safe. Uh, the, the second one, which also answers a couple of questions that were sent to us, is this point here on uh, reopening mandatory requirements. And that's the way the guidelines were set up. They gave us uh, absolute requirements, and then they gave us items for consideration uh, afterwards. And, and this is just under the requirements. It tells us that school districts and other applicable schools are expected to fulfill existing mandates regarding the safe and effective transportation of students who are homeless, in foster care, have disabilities, and attend non-public schools and charter schools. Although meeting these obligations will certainly pose challenges, and I will definitely agree with that, uh, districts, uh, these expectations continue to be in place. So that kind of answers a few questions about why there might be a few children that are going five days. Uh, and then there's other uh, parts where parents have asked, uh, how come uh, CTE or a few other things uh, we can't do? So we had to be very careful to make sure to follow these guidelines. And going through and arranging the A cohorts with the B cohorts and finalizing that with transportation has proven to be quite a challenge. Uh, but we've been up to that. And we're going to be uh, starting today because we finally have all that information pooled together and the cohorts being all split up. Uh, we now have the ability to start the routing. And just so you know, that is, a, uh, that is gonna be a, a, an absolute interesting project for us. But we're gonna get the information to you as soon as we possibly can. It's in our best interest as well as your best interest to be able to get that information so that you know what's happening. But what we have to do at this point is we have to get all of the information, say, uh, when we're looking at seven through 12, we need to know every student in A uh, for middle school and every student in A for high school, coordinate uh, those students to find out how many that we have on, a, uh, on that particular run. And if there's more than can be on a bus, then we need to make adjustments. And there's going to be a lot of adjustments because we're going to build in a, a slight buffer, if at all possible, too but we just don't know the, the exact numbers until we start actually routing things. But we do wanna assure everybody that safety is the number one thing that we have going on here. We're not going to have any student behind the driver. And then after that, it's one student per seat and they will be divided up and social distanced properly. So uh, until we know the numbers, I don't know if every one of those seats are gonna be full, but they could be. But at the same time, we're very relieved that the numbers that we have are, are reflecting what you as many of your parents, uh, many as parents, have done in, in transporting your children because we just couldn't do it. For the same reason that schools can't have 100% attendance right now, there's just no way we could have 100% attendance on a school bus. Uh, it just wouldn't be safe, we know that. And so we're, we've taken precautions on that, but we're cleaning as well to help. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, Mr. Coughlin really brought out a good point about uh, nice insurance policy for this ceramic coating that we'll be putting. It's also gonna work on the school buses. So we're gonna give that uh, a, a go. And then the committee said, you know, Horseheads has always gone above and beyond when it comes to cleaning and everything else. Well, there's no exception here when it comes to the transportation and the school buses. So uh, just to give you an example, if your child gets picked up in the morning on the first run, uh, then when they're dropped off to their particular schools, then uh, the driver will get out and they will do a cleaning of the bus. Then they will let that bus set uh, by itself 
for 10 to 15 minutes, get back on the bus, and then do the second run. So there is a cleaning right before. And then when the runs are all done for the morning, those buses come back to the parking lot, they are cleaned again. So you get the idea. The same thing will happen in the afternoon and in the evening. So there, there's a, a lot of effort that's going into making sure that there's no cross-contamination, that there's a reason why we have cohort A and that we have cohort B. And we do our best not to mix them. Now, I know there's some questions out there about times. Uh, we're going to be working on those and getting to those, uh, getting those to you as soon as possible. Um, and as always, and for those of you that are new as well to the school district, as always, just the nature of the beast with transportation is we'll do our best to give you a rough idea, uh, but we really aren't going to know. And remember, this is all new for every, every one of us. We are going to know the exact, and it's going to probably take us a week to work that out, to find out exactly what it is. But we'll work with you, and don't be afraid to call us, because uh, we can call the buses and find out where they are, how long, and so forth, and we'll work with you on that. And we expect a lot of that communication, because without it, it just doesn't flow, and we need that. Uh, so the cleaning is going to be a big part of it. The routing is going to be coming up soon. And I also just want to mention that um, when we're putting these things together, uh, sometimes there's a lot of uh, discrepancies, shall we say? Let me give you one example. The guidelines for SED, uh, we're talking about how if, uh, if the sneeze guards want to be installed on the school buses, then that was acceptable. Well, it's acceptable for SED. But transportation has to go to DOT, FMCSA, SED, DMV, and, and find out which one has the one standard that is the strictest. And that's the one we have to follow. Because if we don't follow that one, then we're not in line or compliant with one of the other organizations or agencies. So there has been a lot of work that's put into finding out what we can and what we can't do. So we're doing the safest things uh, that we can on the school bus. And for an example, the sneeze guard, they're not allowed. We can't put those things up because the students and the way the buses are built need to be able to have uh, a way to get out of the bus if possible and they drill on that type of thing. So everything that is uh, being that can be considered has been considered. It's transportation has uh, a lot of work to do over the next couple of weeks, but uh, we're happy to answer questions as we go along and uh, we'll get that information to you as soon as we can. So thank you, Pete, on that. Just to hit a couple things. There will be more information coming out from the middle school and high school on parent drop-off and pickups, similar to when we reformatted the entry into the middle school and uh, pictures of showing the flow, especially at the high school with uh, the construction that's been going on. Uh, I know Miss Earl uh, is on, but she will be working on senior parking uh, and where they will be parking because at this time uh, that will be something that has to be managed, but they will be sending something out shortly uh, to try to address all of these issues. So please bear with us. You had heard that the A cohort and the B cohorts are set. We will be mailing out, uh, we are extracting the information today for a, a mail letter uh, so be looking for that to indicate when your children are on which day uh, that they're in person and which three days that they're remote. If there is a problem with that, uh, as if there's an error, please understand you cannot pick A or B day for your family. We have tried to make sure families, our households are on the same day. So if there's a problem where one member of your family isn't on the same day, it might be because of educational programming, but please pick up the phone and call your building principal. They will address that. Just so that you know, those, that information will be going out later today. Additionally, a revised calendar will be going out today, which will also color code when we'll be in school on A days, when we'll be in school on B days, and when we'll be 100% remote, at least for the start of the year. And there will be an adjusted schedule for the start of the year as well with the first week after Labor Day being entirely superintendent conference days to give our teachers, faculty and staff and the buildings the ability to update. And then we will do a slow transition over the next three weeks and that will be explained in an email coming out. So please understand there will be a lot of items coming out uh, in the near future. Please check your email, talk with your building principals. I'm sure Mr. Holloway and Ms. Earl and their staffs will take care of it.
One additional thing before we move on, I just noted before we get the food service, is the question about BOCES. BOCES and transportation. We will be following the Horsehead Central School District model for all educational programming. In other words, we will transport those students in BOCES for their cohorted day in the district. In other words, if your student is assigned to come to school on an A day, uh, they would come to school on that A day, say it's Monday and Tuesday, and they would go to BOCES on Monday and Tuesday. We will transport for that. On Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for that cohort, the student is expected to be in remote. They are not able to go to BOCES at that point because if we're mixing the 21 different other school districts together, we would be violating some of our cohorting protocols and students do not have the ability to drive to BOCES. So please understand BOCES follows the home school district schedule and each district is offering something a little different. If you're a student in New Visions, you will still follow the school district's uh, schedule for A days and so forth. The only difference is they sometimes have independent internships that are on those other days. They can drive to those internships. Uh, so please just check with your principals on that, but we have to follow our protocol for safety and security. I hope that helps. And then uh, there was a question on the private schools. Private schools we do pick up, but they usually wait in our schools. Under this new format, they cannot wait in our schools. Schools. They are not our students, so they will have to be in open air outdoor. Parents will need to adjust to that. In addition, we will have to look whether or not BOCES will, uh, whether or not the private school students will be picked up five days a week because officially all students are supposed to follow their home school schedule. So that might be something that our private school students that will get transported on whichever day and the other three days, if they have 100% in school and private, they may have to transport themselves and families will need to be made aware of that. So at this point, let's talk about nutrition. One of our proud moments is that we've been providing meals and services for our students that have some food insufficiency or just general needs. Uh, from basically March until up to now, and I want to thank our board for doing that uh, because we really are not required to do it in the summer, but we wanted to help our community as best possible. And what better group with our food service and our transportation department that have been making that happen as they shift to this new environment for the coming year as well. Joe? Thank you. Um, so a couple of things about nutrition. Uh, are here with building upon what's already been said for safety and health. There will be integrated socially distanced dining with cafeteria pickup in accordance with safety and health guidelines. The um, students will pick up individual portions of food and there wouldn't be um, things like our salad bars or self-service uh, shared utensils and things of that nature anymore. Um, for students who are enrolled in the Horsehead Central School District and uh, would be 100% online learning, we are still going to offer meals home in the same manner in which we've been operating since March for the most part. In addition to the 100% uh, distance learners, we will have the AB cohort. The dates, the days that you are off, you can also sign up for a three-day meal pack that will include breakfast and lunch. Um, for in-person, I'm sorry, for in-person and uh, meals that are sent home, we will be going back to the free, reduced, and paid. Um, that's a change. As Dr. Douglas had mentioned, we've been operating underneath the emergency meal plan for um, March through now through the summer. And that was a, a opportunity that came about from the USDA and they were providing the free meal um, reimbursements. And as of the start of school, uh, we will be going back to the uh, applications that will need to be filled out and they are available on our website. And that is all. And we would highly encourage anybody, there's confidentiality to this, please reach out to your neighbors and friends that may be having difficulty. We know there are many people during this very challenging time that do. Please reach out to your building principals or food service 
to ensure that you get your students the food that they need uh, and assist them because a healthy student, a well-fed student will help all in this endeavor. Kelly, would you like me to start this one off and then you can fill in a little bit? So um, one of our teams that came together with our committees was on the social emotional well-being. The New York State guidance was very clear on making sure that we address um, this work. As a district, this has already been one of our educational uh, our initiatives um, and something that came together in the Horsets 2030. So we had laid a significant groundwork when it came to considerations of the, the social emotional well-being. Uh, there's an expression that we've used Maslow before blooms when talking about meeting the students needs before they're ready for the education that we deliver as part of our primary mission. Um, so some of the questions that came in talked about those social emotional and things that were discussed by uh, Kelly uh, facilitated a, a group um, that went, I think address some of these, especially that, that, that last one and what that might look like. So I'll let her briefly speak to that. Sure, so as the uh, committee work was outlined in the start of the presentation, social emotional well-being was one of those committees. Um, we had a variety of stakeholders, uh, both community parents, as well as staff that participated uh, in our group. We met over three days for a total of about 10 hours uh, and really focused on the social emotional well being of three areas of our students, our staff, and our families, taking a look at what we may need to do, what supports we can offer prior to coming into school, as well as once we come into school uh, for all three of those um, areas. Some of the things that we had talked about, you know, we'll highlight in the slide, but other things that were equally as important as we really wanted to focus on students and staff and families having the ability to feel safe for when their students enter the building. So we're currently working with uh, the social workers in our district. We also had on that committee a guidance counselor as well as school psychologist. We'll pull them back in again. Uh, as we start to look at ways to support everyone as they enter the building. Um, as someone had mentioned earlier, we've been fortunate enough to be in our offices since about mid-June, which has allowed us to you know, regain some of that comfort level, being in the building and being around people and understanding what our practices are is when we need to wear masks and when we need to socially distance. You know, and those are some of the things that we really feel important that staff have an opportunity to work through so they feel comfortable, so that when the students get there, the students feel comfortable, or the, the staff feels comfortable supporting the students as the students work through, um, you know, the needs that they may have feeling comfortable in the school environment again. Um, so we have various uh, trainings that will be coming up for staff and strategies that we will be using uh, to help everyone through that process. And it will be a continued focus throughout the school year as we you know, continue working through the ups and downs and the changes that may occur as we're presented with new situations. Um, so we have a large number of varied staff that are focusing on this. I know that Chris and Ron have been uh, having conversations as well as our elementary principals about those orientations, those virtual chores, that freshman first day, and what that looks like going into this this new school year and how it has to look different. Um, did you, either you just want to speak briefly to some of the ideas that were out there? I know we're in the planning phase, so we're not exactly at solidification, but I know you've had these conversations with your staff. I can say at the high school, we also um, are looking at a lot of construction, so that will change not just for our freshmen, but for all of our students that are entering. So we're trying to set up something so they all know the new layout of the building. Um, as everybody's known, the link is now no longer, and we have a new connective uh, hallway, so we're working with that. As far as the middle school, our biggest concern is our new eighth grade students and our incoming seventh grade students. Um, normally at this point, our seventh grade students would have come over as sixth graders to tour the middle school and we'd be right in the midst of our horses orientation program with our guidance counselors over the summer. Um, so I actually have a meeting with a group of staff tomorrow to talk about 
given the fact that we can't do that right now, what, what are those first couple of days of school going to look like uh, for all students, but specifically our seventh grade students that, you know, are anxious about how do I get to my classes? Um, one of the things I can alleviate uh, stress from is lockers. I know that's one of the big things that students are worried about. There aren't going to be any lockers this year. So remembering the combination, learning how to open the locker, uh, so we can alleviate that stress because it won't be an option this year. They'll be carrying bags uh, to each of the classes. So really the big thing is how to get around uh, the building and it's really just two big squares on top of each other and it's very difficult to get lost. Uh, students typically learn it within a couple of days. At the very longest, it's, it's a week. Um, the other thing I think that will alleviate some stress is obviously we're going to have about 50% capacity. So uh, the crowded hallways that we would typically see those first uh, weeks of school, it's not going to look like that. It's going to look very different. So uh, the amount of staff that will be available won't change, but the number of kids that they're going to have to help is going to be half, so that should help that uh, situation a little bit. Uh, we are looking at possibly what our schedule pickup looks like. Um, if we are able to pull that off and follow that, the safety guidelines and the health department guidelines, um, possibly bringing our seventh grade students into pickup schedules in person and then do a self-guided tour in small groups. So as Mr. Gill mentioned, these things are all still in the planning stage. And as soon as we have answers, we'll certainly communicate that to you. Ron, will the middle school be using planners or should parents plan to develop their own planning device for the year? Uh, we will be planning our planner just like we always do. So yep, students will receive those. Um, and I would say we'll have to work out a plan. If any student that's 100% remote would like that, uh, we'll figure out a pickup or something to make sure that they get one as well. But yes, every student that'll be here will receive a planner. And Chris, if somebody didn't get something from last year or yearbook or is missing something, all they have to do is contact your office, correct? Yep, we have all of that in our South office at the high school currently. So you could stop down anytime between 7.30 and 3.00. And just to jump in, I would say that'd be the same case for the middle school as well, Dr. Douglas. So I know, in, sorry, Tony, just trying to hit a couple of questions. Um, as we get through the social emotional, I know we're going to be shifting towards the educational plan, uh, which is the sort of the meat and potatoes, but there's been some questions about athletics, extracurriculars, so that I can put people um, on notice right now is that there are it's really no way we can do band concerts, extracurriculars, after school, or sports at this time. That will be governed by the state, uh, and at this point, they are held off for athletics until the 21st, um, but I, my guess is we just have to wait and see. But at this point, things after school, we are really focusing on the educational component, not necessarily the extracurriculars at this time. Uh, at the high school, the class officers and the class advisors will be authorized as well as the yearbook. In addition, our National Honor Society, because these are academically related, both the middle school and the high school are authorized. But other than that, there are no authorizations for athletics or extracurricular or evening programming, such as open houses and so forth. We will work around some of those as much as we can. Please understand that there is extensive amount of costs with what we are doing and that is going to be a determining factor as we go as well. So thank you and I hope that addresses those questions. So go ahead, Tony. Sure, and those ad hoc ones we're gonna see at the, uh, at the uh, later part of the, the presentation just to make sure we're thorough in addressing all the questions that came into us. They really were more like administrative or didn't fit into the, some of the, the committee work, but still conversations we're having. Um, so I know this this particular meeting is, um, or this time together was really for a secondary focus. I know the questions about uh, orientation and um, virtual tours also came at the, the pre-K through six, uh, rest assured families that we're having those conversations as well, what that looks like and how do we meet the needs of those, those younger and primary level kids. So those plans and development uh, as well. Sh uh, shifting gears to the, um, our last committee that, that came together, this uh, instructional, um, with the different facets of the, the plan to address. Uh, as Tom was referencing, the, the external academic programs that we uh, participate in and through BOCES, um, the plan is uh, New York State, you know, really uh, charged districts with focusing on our most needy populations and making sure that there's equity in the services that they require. 
Um, so we do have students that will attend more than just the two-day hybrid because of the, the need of the student, uh, whether it be those that have been into our alt ed programs, our special ed uh, BOCES programs, our 6181, 121, 3 plus 1, et cetera. These, these high, um, uh, these, these classrooms of special need uh, will run in, in additional days because of that. Um, the BOCES CT and the general ed uh, and uh, new visions will run on the, um, uh, the, the same schedule that we follow, as Tom uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the STEM is a nuance that will work with those families on that, um, that four day rotation. Uh, more information to come from that. I know they're starting their orientation for those that participate in that particular program. Um, one of the questions we heard a lot about um, shifting to, to attendance um, was, you know, how is attendance taken? What does this look like? Uh, I, I, it's clear to us, and you can see from the bullets that follow, that um, we have to have developmentally appropriate synchronous and asynchronous learning that happens with our students. And you can see that there's got to be regular substantive interactions with appropriate certified teacher regardless of the delivery method. Sorry to be reading to you, but I just want to make sure you see the quotes and these are intentional and what was the expectations of New York State and what our plan is intended to follow. And what we teach, or was questions of what are we teaching, have to still align with New York State standards. And we've done a lot of curricular work in the last couple of years as a district and some amazing work with our teachers in talking about that change and the essential questions and really hitting the essentials of our of our curriculum and, our, and student learning, and what are those routine times and scheduled times for students to interact? Those have to be scheduled as part of our plan, um, and it all kind of encapsulates into our development and our incorporation of a learning management system, which uh, one or two people in, in the questions and inquiries mentioned, uh, Canvas and some other, other ones, um, Ingenuity. We have looked at several different uh, learning management systems, and it's a, it's a I'll explain more. Let me, give you a moment. Let me go through this so you have a visualization. We have Microsoft Teams. Um, we have Google Classroom, um, our tools. Um, we have resources like um, YouTube, uh, Flipgrid, Khan Academy, um, Nearpod. There, there are all these educational tools that we have at our disposal and that we've implemented many of them um, in, the, in the spring. What a learning management system does is it combines all of those to a single point access, something we heard loud and clear from the community as well as our educators, a single point access to which a parent or a student goes and sees their classes, sees what's due and when in a very clear format. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this, so this learning management system takes our, incorporates with school tool, our student management system, incorporates um, the work done by our staff and our, in our, um, all those uh, instructional tools I was just referencing and brings them into one area, one spot for one stop shop. I mean, so um, it also allows for the collaboration between teachers and as a student, I go in and I have a drop down and I select my classes. Again, Canvas, Schoology, um, <clears throat> Ingenuity, Buzz are some of the ones we looked at. Uh, one in the forefront right now is a program called It's Learning. And uh, we're having that tested out and uh, more to come on that very, very quickly as we start to provide the professional learning for staff, um, for students, and for the families because there is a parent portal aspect to that. So um, that system has a analytic that shows when a student is engaged in, um, in the system and when they're logging in. We had questions about, well, I work all day. Uh, my child might not be able to access things until night. You know, are they expected to be in attendance um, for a synchronous, for a live instructional piece. Um, it's, of course, we would love to have that. That's ideal for those moments of, of, of synchronous instruction. Um, but we also understand that we have to make um, work with those families that don't have that opportunity or do have connectivity issues, as we'll talk about momentarily with the technology aspect of this. In the end, attendance will be taken. It has to be taken. New York State requires it. And we all, but we have to separate it as a system to say, um, are they unable to attend because of a connectivity issue? Or are they unable to attend, uh, or are they is a self-selection and refusing to attend? Um, so the, we have to make sure we have those conversations with those families to sort that out to appropriately mark attendance on our end. So yes, attendance is required. Tony, in regards to like attendance, one of the things is that throughout this, especially at the secondary level, it is the expected uh, position of the school right now as much as possible. Students are expected, even when they're online at home, if at all possible, they are expected to follow their course schedule 
and be in their classes at the time the instruction is taking place, correct? Because if a student oversleeps because they're choosing it, that's going to be a problem. Right, that, that, that's part of that synchronous and the required regular and substantive interaction um, with their teacher and in, in our high school and our middle school, um, or even in, in all our buildings, that's, that's, we have set times where particular topics are covered and uh, there's key to this whole thing, you'll see the word developmentally appropriate. Uh, anybody out there that's ever spent time on Zoom meetings knows the fatigue that goes with that in that interaction. We have to be understanding and realistic of uh, that expectation. And we're having these conversations with, with the staff and, and likewise now about what is the expectation. I don't, do not see my seven-year-old being on a, a call for six hours every day. That's just not developmentally appropriate. So we need to make sure that our students uh, have short snippets of time to which they are provided the direct instruction required. They might jump off um, the call or that live instructional moment to complete tasks or to achieve. And we have to work with our, our staff to you know, rethink how we deliver this instruction and those student learning occurs. So then when they fold back in and they assign and have assignments, grading still is, is, is back into play. We do have to be very careful when um, making sure that a student's uh, turning in or they're, they're working with the LMS to turn in assignments um, that there wasn't an issue because of connectivity. We have to be understanding of that and know that um, while a greater majority of our uh, population does have internet access, we do have uh, a select number that do not. And we have to address that grading a little bit different and make uh, exceptions to those particular cases as we work through them. Um, the um, resources, I'm gonna go through the resources and the, the testing and performance base, and I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly to talk about the students with disabilities and the 504 accommodation question. Um, as far as the uh, New York State assessments and tests, it's unclear to where that might play out, um, if New York State will be holding them in January or the three through eight testing or the June testing uh, for the regions uh, is unknown at this time or we anticipate it. We have no, you know, right now we, we we would anticipate that it would happen, but if something happens different from New York State, then we adjust as we did this previous year. Um, those uh, resources. There are a lot of questions on, do I need to purchase things? Do I need to purchase more? What are the supply lists? We still have standard supply lists that will be requested um, that usually comes out from the classroom teachers of the building. Um, know that on our end, Katie Bazzetti the, and myself uh, are working with principals and others to determine what are those, um, those, those tangible manipulatives, especially at the younger levels that we need to purchase more of so that each student gets their own um, um, math manipulatives or phonics manipulatives. Um, as far as books, there's protocols that we uh, need to follow for health and safety. As far as the exchanging of books, it is allowable, but there is a time delay on when a book can be picked up, dropped off, and how long it has to sit before being picked up again. Um, paper packets, um, same thing, we, we anticipate those being used uh, a little bit, most likely uh, heavily more, maybe our primary years, um, given the um, interaction with a screen and the expectation of, of work. Um, so, but paper packets, I would, I would uh, say would still continue, but we're gonna try to put everything in our, our learning management system to have it be more um, uh, that, that online and remote um, option to doing co coursework. Um, the distribution of such materials would be very similar to how we've done in the past. We can use, we are open for business, so picking it up at the district or at the building is a is, um, possibility, but also um, having um, uh, the technology, we'll talk about that distribution in the next slide. So, um, but that again, making sure that um, those, those items do go out. And keep in mind, those that are in the hybrid model, you will be here an A day, and we're, we're thinking about teaching and instruction and learning in a weekly kind of pattern. So uh, a teacher can say, okay, I, next week we're gonna be doing this. I better on my Monday, uh, Thursday, Friday classes, give required materials for them to be able to work Monday, Tuesday from home. So um, it's definitely just a more planning on our end to visualize, visualize that weekly instruction and that approach to um, student learning. Um, okay. Supply list, I guess our, um, um, our could be online at this moment and accessible through our website. And Tony, what I would say about supply lists is also, you know, a lot of supply lists were addressed with what we'd normally use pre-pandemic. It may be a little different right now, 
Uh, obviously, one of the big supplies is the technology, and we will do our, our part to help people out, but we always suggest is, if anything, with a, a life um, assistance down the road, that if individuals can provide their own technology, that is helpful, uh, because we are trying to do this in a remote situation, both in school as well, and we would expect parents and students to bring their computers to school with them, because digital and um, information on using the technology will be done every day in the classrooms when they're here. So we're looking for that help. But most importantly, I, I need the principals to know, and I know they know this from last year, all communications, whether they're parent or teacher uh, or administrative communications need to be sent to the parents as well as to the students. Secondary, it is the student's responsibility, but we should also still communicate with the parents as much as possible, especially during these times. So, um, and uh, like uh, Bill is gonna speak to that technology a little bit more on what we're doing there and, and um, the appropriateness there. Before we move off this slide though, I wanna just talk about those performance-based academics. There was questions about what does PE look like, music, science labs, family consumer science, home ec as, as some of them, uh, uh, there might remember being uh, called, but uh, or facts now. Um, what do those look like? As I said earlier on in the conversation, we're still in a lot of um, preliminary um, conversations about um, what this looks like and working with our administrative team and then with our teachers to develop programs um, and appropriately in this remote and virtual setting in this, this new era of educational instruction. We did very well to, um, as a system, to flip the understanding of what was ingrained in our brain is what education looks like and in-person education to a, a different model in the spring. We have new expectations from the state that require further conversation to really grasp how we make this, this next transition. Uh, as food service and transportation and all others have, have we, we knew one model and then now we have another model and then this year we're asking you to combine the two. And it's, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift for, for everybody involved. And so we just, it's the time to plan and have the real rich conversations with, our, with those professionals in the classrooms in those areas is key to this. There is explanation by New York State on what they could look like. Um, the New York State Education Department did put out little clips about PE, think about it differently than in leaving some you know, district um, control of those, those, well, how that might look differently as, but definitely the, the distancing and the 12 feet when it comes to the, the, the PE and music and some activities. Um, science labs, the encouragement to go virtual. Um, and using the time we have them in person um, to do those essential uh, learning and then the, the practice that comes afterwards and uh, how do we need to look at the family and consumer science uh, differently as well coming to the spring. And those are just examples of some of our performance-based academics and by not me, uh, no means all of them. We have a lot of uh, classroom teachers that are doing problem uh, project-based learning that's performance-based that um, and, and whole units of study that they'll we'll just have to rethink. and. and we have a lot of smart people that will figure it out and work with us on that one. Uh, Kelly, did you want to um, address that students with disabilities and that 504 accommodations? Sure. So uh, when the plan came out from the state, part of the verbiage in the guidance was that we needed to give special consideration to students that had high needs, um, which came from a lot of feedback from both parents and teachers around the state saying students that have particularly high needs in the area of of learning and education really struggled with the way things were formatted in the spring. Um, and there were many components to that when we took a look at what that level would mean with regards to high needs and then what support we would be offering. Um, and so from the process we took, both from the work that was happening with the instructional committee as well as what was happening with the social emotional committee, um, we took a look at those and are working uh, together with transportation for the students that have uh, special transportation to come up with a plan for students according that is tiered. So according to what their needs are, the higher the level of needs that are identified on the IEP, the higher level of opportunities they have for increased in-person support. Uh, so the plan came out and then uh, within a week and both an email and a letter came out to staff and to families that identified what that tiered level of support was dependent on what was on the 504 or the IEP uh, plan. So 504 for the most part on a 504 usually are 
program modifications and test accommodations, such as classroom notes, extended time for tests uh, or quizzes, the accommodations uh, that happen within the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. There are also 504 plans, which I think were some questions that had the parents had. So we have some students that have higher needs that need a consultant, such as students that are on the autism spectrum, or students that are transitioning away from an IEP and need help as they're being declassified, going back into the classroom with less support. So they have a special education teacher attached to them. They are afforded more time because they have a greater need identified by the hierarchy of high needs than a student that has program modifications and test accommodations only. And that's it. Students with 504 plans with program mods and test mods don't have needs. We know they have needs that are identified on the plan. Those are being addressed as what's on the plan within a similar structure to what happened in the spring. So if students need copy of class notes, um, they will be able to access that via when they're in person with a teacher or they can be um, uploaded into a learning management system. The system that we're looking at has what's called an immersive reader. So we can have the system read the notes to the student or read the test to the student. Any type of material that's on the page that's printed can be read to them. So there are ways that we are addressing those accommodations and modifications to make sure that the students get what they need. Um, students that have a special education teacher attached to them, uh, which means they need either additional supplemental teaching or specially designed instruction, move up in that tier. So if they have self-contained classes with specially designed instruction from a special education teacher, such as students that are in a special class 15 one or a special class 12 one, they will be coming uh, more than those two days. Uh, and that's outlined in the letter. It's also on the website if there are questions. Um, we also are taking the opportunity right now beyond sending the email and the mailing to have our CSC chairs personally contact every family via phone because we need to make sure that parents understand what they're making choices, you know, what the decisions are that they're making, what the services are gonna look like, what the support is so that they have what's called informed choice. So our three CSC chairpersons are calling every family right now to talk about that tiered support and what that might look like to reaffirm the decisions that the parents are making, that the parents have input, and that they feel comfortable with that. Um, we're also working with the principals. Um, this is focused on secondary, so specifically with Mr. Holloway and Mrs. Earl, and taking a look at the students' schedules, the cohort sizes, the sizes of the particular classes to make sure that we can meet the needs of those students in those increased days that they're coming. Um, the Kelly, students, about tutoring or if there's tutoring needs and CSE meetings have been meeting all along since March, haven't they? Yes, so we've been holding meetings via phone uh, and that was addressed in a letter that went out that we will continue to hold CSE meetings just as we have in March. My office actually never closed down. <laughs> we were working remotely sometimes in the office, but we held CSE meetings and will continue to hold CSE meetings as well as we have reinitiated on a limited basis now, but more so when school starts, uh, evaluations in person. So that will be starting as well. Um, Tutoring really is a general education question. We typically do not have tutoring available for students. Um, so that's not something at this point that we have available. Certainly I would suggest our teachers are fantastic about helping students and that will be built into you know, the day just as it is in a you know, prior more traditional format. If there are questions or concerns, please reach out to the teachers. Um, they have you know, a bevy of resources that will allow the students, you know, we can re-teach, we can re-explain. I just, I would suggest they need to reach out to that classroom teacher first. Um, the other piece of that tiered support, I wanna make sure that we talk about are those students that have IEPs that are full-time placed in a special education program that is run in conjunction with BOCES. Um, Sometimes those students are in classrooms that are in our buildings. Sometimes our students are up on campus or in other locations. Um, for the special education programming, not the CTE, for special education, the students will be offered five days a week and we can transport them five days a week. 
Um, so that is different than the question that came earlier about career technical education, because this is their class um, for education and uh, different than the technical piece. Um, and so Teresa Woodworth, she's the chair for most of those programs. She will be reaching out if she hasn't already to families to answer questions that they might have, but we're working uh, with BOCES for that. Goes without saying, Kelly, anybody that has individual questions about their children should just reach out to the respective CSC chair. Absolutely. If you haven't heard from the CSC chair yet, we have uh, a large number of students. We are working our way, uh, you know, through everybody that needs to be contacted. We really um, value parent input on the decisions that are being made. And so if you haven't heard from someone and you have questions, absolutely reach out to us or the building principals and we'll make sure somebody gets back to you. Thanks, Kel. Uh, the, the next piece on Bill, I'll have you chime in momentarily is on the technology. Uh, we have some questions about um, devices and um, uh, what, what it looks like and um, parallels with the spring, uh, as well as your bring your own device and the individual specs for that and those were questions asked. Um, uh, I'll talk about connectivity and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over. I know our transportation department and, and Bill and the tech department have been working with that aspect, but just briefly, we started an initiative in the spring, uh, even before that, for, for some, a couple of years now, we've had a bus that's been outfitted with an access point for Wi-Fi capability. We've, in the purchasing of new buses, um, we've had to make sure that they, we were installing those at um, access point um, to make sure our buses um, would have that um, internet connectivity. So those, that, that conversation is being worked out with the tech department, transportation department, with BOCES who help service us and, and as well as the vendor <clears throat> to ensure that our technology on those buses and we can deliver um, to locations uh, as we did in the spring, as well as to municipal, municipalities and to fire departments where we will hook up our safe access to our server, which is the key. It's not just an open access gas, it's access directly through the safety of our server and the protections um, that we have um, in, in that for a child to get on and be able to um, grab what they need to, to, uh, or to upload and download material. Um, so we are also um, working in conjunction with some other community agencies and partners to explore that because it's not just a district, uh, district issue, obviously broadband across the, um, uh, the reaches of the, the Southern tier um, need to be considered. So there are organizations right now working on that as well. Um, when you think about uh, devices, Bill, um, let's talk, talk briefly to that and what that looks like. Um, so we're looking at a distribution of um, district laptops that we have, that we have within the cart. Um, really, it becomes down to a supply and demand. It's going to be very much like in the spring. In the spring, we distributed probably roughly around a little over 800 laptops to students within the district. Um, and that really does cut into our supply of what we have. We are looking to purchase, but again, we get into a supply demand, which is a global phenomenon. It's not just something unique to Horsets District um, that we're just finding a lot of vendors are trying to keep up with the supplies that a lot of districts are trying to go after. Um, and even if you just look at community, um, if you go to Best Buy or any of these other local stores trying to buy a computer at this point, you're going to find uh, that there are a lot of sold out and a lot of products. So this is something that's kind of a phenomenon that we're kind of a hurdle we're trying to overcome, but we're looking to, again, to increase our devices to try to distribute as many as we possibly can to help those in need. Some of the things that we've been able to do is we open up a BYOD function within our schools. What that allows is that any a student with a computing device can actually bring that to school and connect to our network and have access to their online and have their uh, computer filtered through the safety of GST BOCES and all the securities that are provided there. So they can safely travel online, um, restrict it to areas that they're not supposed to be going, but at the same time being able to um, interact with a lot of the cloud-based technologies and softwares that we employ here. So one of the things is that people have, you know, questions have asked is like, what kind of device should they buy? Um, you know, we do have kind of a outline of a, probably a product that would work. The best thing I would say is I'm going to start with what is the typical 
laptop that we usually employ here on our district. And it's a standard Windows-based laptop. Uh, about 13 inches is probably a suitable size. It's not too heavy and should have the power that you need. Um, 128 solid state hard drive. That's kind of a nice, uh, that's a nice mid range um, hard drive, gives you enough memory and things of that nature. Also, eight gigs of RAM, which is really becoming a lot of the standard, but that will allow you to really process a lot of those things. Another thing is an i5 Intel processor. Also look for like AMD or Intel Pentium processors. They should be sufficient for what we need to do. Um, people have asked about Apple products. Apple laptops can come in. That's fine. We can You can bring in a lab, uh, Apple laptop. Chromebooks. Chromebooks are fine. The one thing with Chromebook is that you're going to need to provide a Google email for your student to be able to use that Chromebook. I don't think a lot of people understand that Chromebook is web-based uh, machine. It tends to be on the lighter side as far as specs go, um, but it is needs connectivity for it to function fully. Uh, you cannot install programs on there. You can put apps on, but not install programs. So Chromebooks will work in our system as a BYOD. They can connect with our Office 365, which we provide. And if we employ an LMS, they should not have no problem using that LMS with that Chromebook. Bill, it's safe to say they should also have a webcam because webcam is integral in the remote live streaming and recording, correct? Yeah, I would suggest that anytime you buy, you get a webcam and an integrated mic. That is becoming standard on most devices, so usually that's there. But yeah, make sure you want to look that, especially with the remote learning. Um, we do have a spec sheet that you can kind of look at. I would say if I was, if you have the means, a Windows-based laptop, um, with a minimum of four gigs and 128 solid state hard drive um, should get you enough to do everything that you need to do at school as far as watching videos and everything. Um, well, what, I, what I would suggest is because we're getting a little technical here on a call that we will post the recommendations of different parameters for technology on our website so that people can use it as a guide and reference. We have that all set and um, whatever, so we'll put that up sooner than later. Um, as far as distribution goes, that's going to be uh, something we're still kind of working out the details. We have to keep safety in mind uh, as far as the resources and, you know, making sure that we're handing these out as well as keeping track of where these laptops are going. Um, so that is something that we've done in the spring. We're going to try to employ it now, try to make it maybe bring it down to scale so we can move a little bit faster. Uh, but those are things we're looking at and we're considering at this point. Thank you, Bill. The last uh, set of questions that we received were kind of just uh, <coughs> ad hoc, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, materials. Can I move that last one, Bill? Yes, and one of the questions was, is. Uh, if I'm 100% remote, can my child still play sports? Um, although uh, the state would normally uh, have anybody in homeschooling and so forth not, this is a different type of question, uh, but the state has given guidelines that students that are 100% remote because of COVID would be allowed to come in and play their sports. Um, we've talked about this at the board meeting, although I don't understand it. Uh, because really what we're saying is that we're 100% remote because we're concerned about it, but we're going to intermix anyways for the purpose of sports. But that is a person's right and prerogative. However, again, I do not know whether or not sports or other after school activities will be even opened up this year. So please be aware. Uh, Tony, take us through the rest, especially code of conduct, cafeteria usage, and just give sort of a sample that basically for middle school and high school, I believe, we will be running by the student's actual schedule uh, so that people understand that's how the plan's going to work, both in person and remote, correct? Yes. We'll be detailing those conversations with our teachers and our administrative staff to um, talk about the schedules. But yeah, Chris and Ron have built schedules of regular period days um, and expectations of connecting, regular connection with the 
uh, certified teacher, the teacher of record. A specific question that came up uh, from a, a parent, or maybe even two parents, but about National Junior Honor Society and National Honor Society. I would anticipate that those programs run um, in some capacity. We'll have to look at them differently, of course, given their um, some of the the, um, the pillars of um, a community and service and what that looks like. Um, also, um, the yearbook um, will be things that uh, will be clubs and organizations that would definitely run looking into this following year, but just looking at them different and making sure we do it with the health and safety parameters in mind. Uh, code of conduct, there was a question just about, you know, um, I, let me just put it, it was specifically the, the dress code and being on a call and being appropriately dressed, not being in pajamas is what was being suggested. Um, know that our code of conduct, and Caitlin referred to this earlier, applies in this new environment, um, whether it be in the remote aspect or the in-person. That, that Our code of conduct still holds to the student's expectation of being engaged with our, with our, um, with our school. Um, calendar and daily schedule. Um, Tom, that was more just about uh, the change to the calendar. You made mention to that. I'm looking for that to be coming home soon. But there was a question about snow days and how the snow days look in a remote environment. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we are changing the calendar, especially at the start of the year. Um, but snow days, um, basically, we could shift and teach 100% remote. We should try to keep all of our active days so we do not disrupt like the spring break and, and so forth. And, but even though we have the snow days and we could probably work through them, sometimes, in my judgment, everybody just needs a break too. Uh, we just need to make sure at the end of the year we have our 180 days and meet our hour requirements and we will keep that going. So please pay attention to announcements on any of those days uh, as to what is happening. Please also understand that if by chance the governor does close down the state uh, and schools, schools will still be operating as school district employees are known as essential employees. And our teachers, although our students won't be here, our teachers will be in their classes following their schedule and moving forward with the educational purpose. So school is going to take a much different look than it was March when we were thrown in it to the point that it will be actively engaged daily throughout. Uh, there's a couple other questions, Tony, real quick while I just go through. I think we're wrapping up. But if you can really hit what you think about music, PE classes, the distancing, that they require 12 foot distance uh, and so forth, uh, just so that people know, as well as maybe about like technology for advanced math classes, parents should really invest in the calculator for themselves. And if they can't afford one, what do they do? Okay, so there's a couple things there. Let's start with uh, earlier at, on the slide, it did talk about our performance-based um, academics. Um, we, we and you'll recall, I just mentioned that we have to have some conversations with our music department and our PE department. There are some GSTY BOCES program, um, conversations happening in those special areas to really rethink, given the health department standards of participation in those, uh, those classes, what they look like. Um, so definitely looking to, um, um, rethink that those delivery, no different than how we're rethinking the delivery of education in all our all of our classes in this hybrid model and remote world that we've now entered. Um, your second point, Tom. Uh, about calculators, the use of the, the people. LMS currently has a embedded calculator. It is a um, advanced math symbols are available in these uh, learning management systems. Um, so I'll be curious from as if we go into the adoption of that LMS, what our math department thinks of its ability to handle up to what level and at what level. Um, it goes without saying many of our parents do and have purchased the uh, TI, uh, Texas Instrument Calculators, to meet the standards. We do have ones that are purchased by the district um, in-house um, to provide and assist with students uh, for use. Um, so I don't think anything has really changed that this year. The addition, this of course, will be the LMS and what that's able to do and how our math department feels about that integration tool. And then. Uh, what about music, 12 feet distancing, PE, and that music is not going to probably look like we'd normally be used to just because of the parameters around that. That goes without saying, correct. 
Um, you also, just to make sure we clear everything on the other's areas of inquiry, um, there was conversation of who I contact for X, Y, and Z. Uh, typically every school year, we do have a communication of, you know, first, here's your first point of contact as you go through. Um, it's, it's either in our district calendar and or our website, and it's actually probably one of our procedures and policies uh, regulation about uh, the contacting of who and what particular issues. I think we might have to relook at that, to be honest with you, uh, for the parent that asked that, about what that looks like in the, the remote, especially when it comes to technology issues and assistance with uh, devices. Uh, that's something that um, Bill and I have been chatting about to figure out how do we support parents and students um, in this technology aspect. I, I, I've said, and I, I heard it from a tech director many years ago, that our technology is not a, a, a flip of a switch electricity. There is things that can go wrong. Um, and our teachers have often been apt, very, very apt to, to change an instructional practice or design or a lesson in the moment when technology doesn't go your way. It's just the aspect of teaching that we all get used to. However, moving into this next phase, it looks when there's a dependency on that technology, um, we really do make sure we're prepared for when the technology is not working appropriately. You know, what are the, um, what, what to reach out to the teacher for, for, for support and who else to reach out when having certain issues. So there's a resource that needs to be found um, Tom and I, obviously, and Katie and Bill have been talking about what other resources are available and how do we um, uh, get those resources. We know that with our learning management system, some of that um, professional learning and uh, tech might come from the, the vendor themselves. Um, while maybe if it's issues with a district provided laptop, we have systems within for like a, a help desk, you might call it. But we really do have to, to figure that out to make sure because our technology is not like light switch, much more. Uh, um, this is what I'm looking for. I will say um, complex. Um, so, anyways, back to the communication. I think some of that question came out. Uh, questions came out. Who do I contact? If I'm having issues doing X, Y, and Z. So we'll revisit that chain of communication plan that we put out every year for questions on a variety of areas and ensure we address the technology side and the instructional practice again. Make sure it's right. Uh, there was questions about the yearbook. I'm sorry, Tom. What? Sorry, we have a question uh, in regards to. Um, the current environment in the United States is around the globe. What cultural curriculum will you be teaching to the students this year? Again, uh, I mentioned earlier that we have to abide by the New York State requirements of, of what's the, 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 the curriculum and the essentials of the curriculum. That was very clear from the New York State MOS, so following the, the standards as established by New York State. We do have cultural aspects as part of our curriculum, um, most, uh, mostly found in our humanities and our, our, our ELA um, pieces of our work, but definitely culture, culture is by definition, um, learn, learn behaviors. And so we find a little bit of culture in all aspects of our, our curriculum delivered by our, our, our teachers. Okay, a couple of quick questions. I think we've covered everything. We'll just have to move on to our finance class. I know we're a little bit over uh, the hour. Yeah, just, I'm sorry, there's two out left on that particular side that we didn't address. I want to make sure that parents know there was a question about your book arrival. Um, Chris, your yearbooks have already been or arrived in there for pickup. Ron, we got an apology level from the from the vendor saying sorry, right? But they're coming. Yeah, we, yeah, we received a letter actually right, right from the company of Light Touch indicating they're working as hard as they can and as fast as they can. Um, our actual local rep has reached out several times saying, I just don't have a date for you. So, yep, received the apology letter. Unfortunately, I don't have a a date as soon as we get the arrival of the yearbooks we'll communicate what that pickup looks like and um, how we're going to facilitate that i'm hoping soon but unfortunately i have no date as soon as you know everybody else will know you got it <laughs> chris I have a question please contact your building principal that will help you the quickest uh tony just two questions right now uh how are labs going to be handled fat like facts science technology as well as um how will textbooks that need to be distributed be handled? And can reading materials such as like for English classes be distributed or information sent out early enough so people can get hard copy? Yes, and we discussed that. I mentioned those things a little bit earlier that those are all things that can occur and will occur. occur. We'll work with our transportation department. We're also open if for parents to be able to pick up things in-house uh, when the means aren't there. It's a more just a time, uh, back in the spring, we did deliver on those aspects. The last uh, point that we had was about some child care questions. Um, and uh, working, many employers throughout Chemung County have been asked to provide a survey to their employees, as did we as a district, 
um, about child care needs, looking at this as a community, again, a community problem like the connectivity I mentioned earlier, that we need to um, ensure that those um, looking to solve and address this problem uh, know the information and know what the need is out there. So uh, there is a group that we are communicating with to see how we can assist with um, the child care aspect of that, understanding that there are days to which um, parents are working and we, we are opening up our economy in the phase four with the governor. And what does that look like to support parents? Okay, and the one last question we haven't covered is can I, we've made a choice for our schedule, can I change that choice? Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we have to start with our planning process. So the choices have been selected and that is the choice that's in place. If in time, probably uh, down the road, if there's some type of major life altering event, please reach out to your principal and it will be an administrative discussion but we have to keep things as steadily and consistently as possible uh, where remote cannot switch back easily to the hybrid and all hybrid can move towards the remote when needed, but we must maintain our busing, transportation, food schedule, and we cannot make many quick changes to that whatsoever. So please understand, uh, we'll do what we can, but right now there is not a lot of options. So those choices are there. One last thing is, I know Katie's here for our budget. We've been very good so far, but Katie, can you talk a little bit just about financing budget, where we stand, what we have ahead, and then we'll wrap it up um, with a final statement. Sure, I'll, I'll keep this brief as I know it's, it's getting late. Um, uh, but school districts, you know, along with other uh, businesses in the state in the in the country, are facing the same um, financial challenges as a result of COVID-19. Um, when the governor approved his state budget earlier in the year, there was mechanisms built into his budget that can pull um, aid back from state agencies such as school districts um, at various points throughout the year in an effort to assist the state with its own financial challenges. Uh, so we're working through um, all of our purchase, all of our purchasing this summer to uh, provide everything that we need as far as the PPE, the cleaning, the disinfecting, the air filtration, all the technology that's needed um, to make this online aspect of our education plan a success, um, while being mindful of, of these looming challenges that, that could be ahead of us. Um, we are fortunate to have um, support of our budget through our community and we will um, continue to provide everything that we need to provide within the limitations of our approved budget. Um, at this point, um, because of everything we need to purchase and um, the significant price tag that comes along with it, we're looking at this point repurposing um, how our money was allocated in our budget. Um, so things that we would have purchased in a, in a quote unquote normal year, um, we're repurposing those funds at this point to purchase everything that we need at this time. Um, so there are challenges ahead. Um, if there's relief, um, maybe from the federal level to assist states or assist schools, you know, that could be a game changer. Um, but at this point, we're operating a tight budget, focusing on those items of health and safety um, and things to make our education a success. So be assured, everything will be provided that needs to be provided, um, but we are closely monitoring the financial situation. Thank you, Katie. And that, that is an important note that we have had uh, wonderful support from our Board of Education, our community, and we continue to want to rise and make this as excellent as possible for the education of our Horsehead students, the safety of our staff, as well as the general benefit of the Horsehead <laughs> community in, in large. Uh, it is quite a significant undertaking. Uh, we need to hire additional individuals for maintenance custodial staff cleaning uh, as well as for our technology staff to try to address added needs and requirements uh, as well as potentially coverage and monitoring and supervision whether it's in our bus uh, department our bus drivers and so forth ladies and gentlemen we know that there are people without jobs and we know that there are people looking for jobs please, if you know somebody, reach out and ask them to contact our HR department as we have potential many opportunities with a strong benefit program that adds to the community sense. We are currently hiring and we need people to help us make this as safe as possible. 
Uh, ultimately, the governor is going to decide whether or not he takes the 20% from us. He has already started delaying some payments by 20%, and that is a major concern because if those cuts are enacted, uh, we will have some concerns that we will have to look at how we can continue operating and what we even offer during that time. So we need to be understanding. Just so that you know, as a final statement, my entire administrative team, this Board of Education, our understanding staff, everybody has some nerves and anxieties, but if we work together from parents to their students, to our staff, to our administration, in trying to make sure we always look out for the other person, being respectful, being flexible, and being understanding, and caring for the health of one another, we will get through this, and that's what we need everybody to remember. We would like to be, as a district, everything to everybody, but we need everybody to understand it is almost impossible to meet that desire. But we will strive, just like our mission says, explore, empower, excel. We will try to excel to that level. So please, whenever you have a problem, reach out and communicate to your building principals. Reach out to the district office staff as needed. We will get back to you within 24 to 48 hours is always our motto, if not sooner. But please make sure uh, that, you know, we are working in collaboration and partnership for the health and well-being for our students, our staff, and our community, but also moving our education ahead as expected to be one of the highest in the regions. I want to thank you for taking this time. We've answered well over 100 to 150 questions during this in a conversation style. If you have others, please look to our frequently asked questions and we will be sending the calendar out as well as other information out as soon as possible along with transportation and your cohorts uh, as quickly as possible today and tomorrow. So at this time, I'd like to thank you and I appreciate you joining us for a conversation.